Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's discussion. I'm Ingrid Swenson, I'm the director of PEER. Uh, this evening's event will focus on two of the artists whose work is part of Swirl of Words, Swirl of Worlds, the exhibition that's currently on at PEER and at Shoreditch Library. I um, mean, it features the work of 14 artists, two of whom are here this evening, Zineb Sidira and Juan Cruz. Zineb Sidira is a London-based Franco-Algerian feminist photographer and video artist. She's best known for her work exploring the human relationship to geography. She's one of four artists shortlisted for the Deutsche Borse Photography Foundation Prize 2021, which just opened last night at the Photographers Gallery and will be on over the summer. She'll be representing France at the 59th Venice Biennale in 2022. Juan Cruz is an artist, writer, and educator. He's exhibited at, he's exhibited at Matt's Gallery, where he is also will also represent him, Camden Arts Centre, Vita de Vit in Rotterdam, Sir Alvis Foundation in Porto, Edinburgh International Festival, and indeed at Pier in 2005, where the work in the exhibition uh, it is is being represented. Um, he's direct. He is a director of a IAAC, the International Awards for Art Criticism, and was a trustee of the John Moore's Liverpool Exhibition Trust. He's been a trustee also of the of Liverpool Biennale and other governance roles. He has worked at a broad range of institutions, both specialist and generalist and with, very, with varying missions and profiles. He is currently principal at Edinburgh College of Art. Jelaine Tordros will be um, the moderator for this evening's discussion. She's the chief executive for DAX, a not-for-profit visual arts rights management organization established by artists for artists. She was the founding director of the Institute of International Visual Arts, INEVA, in London, which over a decade achieved an international represent, reputation for groundbreaking cultural agency at the leading ed, edge of artistic and cultural debates. She's cu curated numerous exhibitions and has written extensively on contemporary art. And she's just published a book called The Sphinx Contemplating Napoleon. Um, for those of you who may not know, one element of this of this project is the publication of a book of poems from 94 languages spoken across Hackney, which have been collected or rather gathered by Stephen Watts. Um, this book is being distributed freely to all Hackney Library members. Uh, the book, the exhibition and the ambitious programme of events and readings and workshops collectively make up the entire project, which will continue until the 14th of August. Um, the event next week in the series, oh no, it's not next week, it's the week after, the, the next event in the series is in conjunction with the European Poetry Festival and is curated by the poet Stephen Fowler and it takes place on the 5th of July from 7 to 8.30 at Hoxton Community Garden. This is a free outdoors event and we hope that it'll, everyone will, will join in. One of um, the poets reading at that at that event will be Fabian Peake, who's also an artist and has work in the exhibition. There's more um, information about that, uh, about that event and all of the other events on our website. Um, just a few words about the technical side of things um, this evening. We are running the talk in a webinar function, and this means that you'll only be able to see the panelists throughout the talk. If you have any questions, um, put them into the Q&A box and these will be mostly addressed at the end of the talk. Um, there's a live transcriptions function turned on which you can select to view or hide. Um, it can be quite distracting so you might want to hide this. Um, and also to say that the event is being recorded. So um, without further ado, um, thank you Delaine for agreeing to host this evening's discussion and we look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ingrid, and congratulations on a really beautiful and thoughtful project, Swirl of Words, Swirl of Worlds, and I hope that we can touch on some of the themes and questions that the works in the exhibition and programme provokes. So I want to start um, 
with you, Zinab, you've got a piece in the show called Mother Tongue, uh, a video triptych from 2002. For those of, you, of, the, of people uh, listening who haven't seen the work, it's across three screens. And we have three conversations, one between yourself and your mother, the second between you and your daughter, and the third between your daughter and your grand and your mother, her grandmother. And the conversations range across early school experiences in France and Britain, where the national language is different from that of uh, the mother's tongue. And so in the first conversation, your mother's speaking an Algerian dialect of Arabic and you're responding in French. Then you're speaking with your daughter in French and she's responding in English. And finally, your mother is speaking to your daughter in Arabic but your daughter sadly doesn't understand and can't respond. Um, so it feels to me that the work is really um, a lot to do with questions of disruption and, and the break that migration affects in the continuity of language and identity. And I wanted to ask you um, if you could say something about the role that language plays in your work which takes many forms, installations, films, photographs, and more recently sculptures. And you're often sort of talking about this disjuncture between past and present. I mean, obviously the, yeah, language is very important um, simply because I'm really working across three country, which is uh, the UK, uh, France, and Algeria. And because of that, I'm having constantly to switch uh, into the language uh, from those countries. Um, so I'm, I'm, it's becoming in some ways quite confusing sometimes because I'm, I can mix the three languages together or, you know, or whatever. So it becomes quite interesting, but it can be difficult at times, especially in a situation where I'm giving, you know, um, a conference on my work and, I, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting where I am literally sometimes or what the audience is or what the audience want to hear, which language. So yes, uh, language is very important also because I do a lot of research in the archives. I do a lot of uh, reading and, you know, obviously, so my reading, I don't read Arabic. So this is quite clearly more, more simple somehow, but I'm always switching between Fr French and English and it becomes more problematic when I'm trying to do um, a project like I'm doing now for Venice uh, to do with Italy where I don't speak the language. And then really I'm kind of uh, realizing that knowing three language, Arabic, French, and, and English doesn't help me to, you know, completely in other contexts. But it makes it really, really interesting and really rich to be honest. I'm always, um, from a very young age, and I don't know it's uh, because in the family we were already, you know, speaking Arabic and French, but I was very, very much being interested in languages. I also grew up a bit in Belgium as a child, so Dutch was also a bit part of my language. So, and I was speaking it quite fluently at one point. So I would, you know, I, I kind of, um, I don't know, I have, an, I love languages. I love hearing people speaking other languages, even if I don't understand them. Um, but obviously when I became a mother and I came in England and I became a mother in England, the question of, of, of transmission of, of tradition or culture or language became quite important. And, um, and to realize that my kids suddenly not, were speaking English and of Arabic anymore, there was this kind of a gap or this kind of jump and French would become funny enough the link really to link perhaps, as you said, my grandmother, my mother, sorry, and my, uh, my daughter, so grandmother and granddaughter, not being able to speak because the French is actually missing between them too. So, um, so I don't know if I responded to your question, but um, yeah, I think I did. So, that's a great start, thank you. Juan, um, your work in the exhibition, Don Quixote, is an audio work created during a series of performances at Pierre in 2005 when over six weeks you presented a live simultaneous translation of Don Quixote. I think the, 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 the recording runs over 150 hours, doesn't it? And I have to confess, I didn't watch all of it, Juan. <laughs> uh, uh, because this is kind of tr translation of an epic text in every sense. It's an epic endeavor. Um, and it's pretty painful to watch because the process of simultaneous translation here is kind of slow and laborious and how can I say it's not it's not the simultaneous translation of United Nations international conferences, 
but uh, to my mind, it's the sort of harder work of trying to make immediate and legible a narrative which belongs to another culture and literary tradition and try and make that live, literally. Um, and you've done a number, haven't you, of performances of oral translations of work uh, from Spanish literature into English. And I think more recently of the American art magazine, Art Forum into Spanish. And, and language and translation in particular has been a sort of abiding preoccupation in your artistic practice. So I wonder if you could say something about why language and particularly translation is so important. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, thanks, Jelaine. And um, yeah, Ingrid, and it's very nice to be speaking with, with Zineb because uh, I was looking at Zineb's work and I think it's just fantastic. There's a lot to talk about between us, I think. Um, but um, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I think, um, well, there's lots of answers to that question, I think. And, and of course, translation and language are, are important. I, I think one of the things that, that, that was, was important for me about translation as a way of, of working as an artist um, uh, was to do that it was some was to do with the fact of, of, of translation being something that um, I could I could do that I never really had to learn um, and so and, and that always seemed to me a little bit um, or, or that seemed to me to have a kind of relationship to what it was like uh, to study uh, to be an artist in, in, in art school when I was in, in art school in the early, late 80s, early 90s. Um, because in a sense, uh, it, it's a subject that you learned without necessarily learning any, any kind of tangible skills. Um, there was a sense of, uh, you know, so you went to art school and, and you didn't really learn how to, no one taught you really how to paint or how to sculpt or how to, how to do anything. You went to art school and you, you, you kind of dwelt in the art school and 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 and, and did things and, and and to me somehow translation seemed to be quite um i suppose quite quite interesting because it, it didn't really feel to me like a skill it was something that that, that that had just kind of come about through my through my upbringing through having you know moved countries when i was um about uh, eight years old you know, came from spain to, to the uk and uh, to wales and, and and didn't speak any english and so that that i learned that so so there was something about about that as a as a skill or as a as a practice um, that seemed to be that seemed to be quite important because it, it sort of seemed to be um, a, a way of doing something that that, that of course was, was 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 determined by all sorts of cultures and all sorts of you know things that have happened before but but in another way it felt it felt rather sort of uncumbered as as a practice uh, and as a way of working and I suppose I I, I justified it to myself because it seemed a sort of slightly absurd thing to do, but I, I sort of justified the, the idea of translating. And I did I made the work first in, in 1990, 1996, I think, at the Cervantes Institute. Um, and the first time I did it, it wasn't recorded at all, and it was really a sort of live performance. It was a sort of oral performance where people came into a space in a basement and walked around while I just continued speaking. Um, I did it first, and, and, and I suppose I justified it to myself as, 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 a, as you know, it was a bit like drawing. It's, it's a sort of, it's a kind of transcription of, of, of something. It's a way of, of, of reflecting on something. Um, but, um, but, but I was, I was yeah, I, I, I think that question of, of, of something that, that was, um, a, a, I suppose, something akin to a skill that wasn't, didn't really feel like a skill felt to me like something that was very uh, close to the way in which artists might engage with uh, ways of working. Um, I, there's something that struck me when you talked about the kind of uh, when you said how, how painful it is to listen to. I, I found myself saying, "Well, you know, you should try doing it," <laughs> but, <laughs> and, and that's that's partly to do with the sort of you know the age of the of the you know of the text. And but something I did, I did think about quite a lot because so when I was I was soon I was I was relatively um, I hadn't been out of art school for quite a long time for for, for long when I when I you know when I when I did that piece and when I was reading it and I found myself that there were certain things that I could translate quite easily, and other things that I that I couldn't because you know the language is quite archaic so there were words that I simply didn't know what they meant and I didn't have a dictionary. But I kind of thought, well, if I'd just been reading this, it would have been the same. But it also reminded me a little bit of the kind the kind of. Uh, you know, when I was at art school, like many art students, I was reading a lot of, you know, Derrida and Foucault and, you know, books that were really, you know, far too complex for me. And actually, I'm not sure I understood those any better than <laughs> if I'd had to translate that into, 
you know, my, 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 you know, my sense of what English might be, I think that might have been as, as halting. So I think there was an interest in the idea of how much you do miss when you're reading something anyway, you know, and how much it is, how much you, you, you I don't think you ever kind of um, uh, absorb everything that you're reading. There's, um, there's another piece in the exhibition um, by an artist called Madiha Ajaz, which is called These Silences Are All the Words, where she's recording conversations with both the librarians and library users about how the language of Urdu uh, and Persian has changed and shifted um, and how English words have come to supplant Persian and Urdu words. And um, it made me think about how, um, you know, Zinab, you were talking about moving between French and Arabic. And when you, this, uh, and your notion, um, one of something which is unself conscious, you know, unpracticed, unrehearsed in a way, and something that happens if you occupy a multilingual space is that you, without being conscious of it, you select words that are the most apposite, the most specific, often ones that are untranslatable mm -hmm. or don't, you know, for which there isn't a precise equivalent. And so there's a kind of nuance and there's a pro that process is, is not, as I say, it's, uncon it's almost unconscious. It's almost like an immediate process and I wonder to take your thought a bit further, if that is akin to the artistic process, where there is a selection process, whereas artists, you are making selections about stories, about subject matter, about objects, which you bring into your practice. And it is because there is something nuanced and specific about those particular stories, objects, elements. Um, <laughs> um, well, I, I guess I'm doing, I, I'm, 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 I, I tend to be, I tend to use words or, 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 or you know, object or visual images that I'm, I feel at ease with, or I, feel, I feel comfortable with, or that I like. Um, uh, that's for the artwork. Uh, you know, I've got uh, an aesthetic that I like, a style that I like. So I would be always attracted by a certain type of things rather than something else, for example. So when I make work, obviously in the archive, for example, when there is a multitude of, 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 of docs, whether they're documents, whether they're written one or photographic or whatever, I will be always attracted by some more than others, which I then select. Obviously the content is also part of it. But when it comes to language, I guess it's very confusing because again, I'm, I'm, my head or my mind is selecting the, the word I feel the most appropriate and at use with. And because I, for example, I studied art in the UK, my artistic language is more British based than French. So now I'm having to give a lot of talk of France and I've always did, but more recently, I'm really struggling with a lot of technical words, which I don't know in, uh, in French, but I do know in English. So I end up dropping them, you know, <laughs> dropping them in English. And sometimes it's fine because it's perhaps the same word, thank God for that, but other times it's not at all. Uh, and then in that case, um, yeah, I, I deal with it either. I try to find the, the, the French version of it or, or I get corrected by somebody in the audience or whatever. So it is a problem and it's funny sometimes because I come up even with words that, that I think do exist in French because I don't. In fact, you know, a kind of frangly, frangly mixture of things. Um, with a visual work, I guess it's, it's probably more, less, less messy, you know, than my speaking. I hope so anyway, so. One. Yeah, um, I, I was I was just I was just reminded by what by what you said and 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 um, Jelaine and and, and Zine, about um, something I read by uh, the poet Thomas uh, Tom Clark, who uh, lives up the road here in in Fife in Pitt and Wean. They have the Cairn Gallery there. And it, th there was a, a particular kind of thing he wrote about the way in which uh, the way in which there, there are certain words that you carry about with you, you know, through your life, um, and the, and and he compares words to to, to flowers. 
you know, so in a sense, you know what a you know what a, a daisy or a bluebell looks like, but actually through your life, they take on different meanings and they they're embodied in different ways. And I thought that was a really beautiful way of, of thinking about what what language and what a word might be through you know through time and through a how it might come to mean different you know different things and and, and emerge in different ways. Um, because for me, uh, and I was also kind of uh, uh, when uh, when when you were talking about about that about that um, you know that that. Sort of materiality of language. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded. I don't know if you have this in it as well. Just when, whenever I am in, uh, find myself in in the UK, um, in a particularly in a kind of public space with someone I can speak Spanish with. Um, the the um, the performance of speaking Spanish becomes extremely expressive, <laughs> and loud, and I think that I think there's a sort of certain kind of. Uh, you know, I think that's something else about about language and words. That there's, I, 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 I have a sense that one becomes a different person speaking different different languages. You know, that there's there's a kind of there's a different thing that your body does. There's a different way that your body behaves. There's a different you know because languages have different tempos. Um, your body acquires a different tempo. Your thinking acquires a different tempo. And and, and I, I I feel quite different when I'm speaking with people in Spanish mm. than when I'm speaking in in English. Um, and I've been trying to make some work recently where I'm trying to do this kind of ridiculous thing of trying to, um, well, trying to write sort of songs. And, and, and in, in, in song, that becomes like really, really kind of explicit, you know, mm -hmm. how, you, how you intone something. So, yeah, I think, I think, I think that's... Um, I think also, I, yeah, so, so, sorry, but also what, what I don't know, you must come across that sometimes that some words are not, like Jusle, uh, Julian was saying, it's not translatable, you know, yeah. or if they translate, there is an equivalence, but it's never exactly the same. And especially when it comes to feeling, I'm always quite surprised that from one language to the other, you have, you have the same feeling, but you don't have the same word to express it. So is it a different feeling? Is it, so it's so, it's so I mean, I'm fascinated by that when I don't find the, the exact translation of a word, I'm always very puzzled that it is possible to not find the, a direct translation of a word, especially when it comes to feelings, because I believe wherever you are, whatever culture or country you come from, the feelings are the same. You know, I mean, we experiment same feelings, which is the words are different to express it. And I just always quite, um, so I always wanted to do a piece of work around that actually, but I haven't managed yet. <laughs> <laughs> Another um, work in the show, which uh, relates to the things you've both been speaking about just now, is Susan Hiller's The Last Silent Movie, which was made in 2007 and first shown at the Berlin Biennial. Um, and it's, it's not silent and it's not a movie uh, in any conventional sense because it, there's no narrative and there are no moving images. Um, what you see is you have words projected across the black screen and you hear several voices speaking in different languages which are completely unrecognizable um, and their lang their lang recordings of voices the last speakers are already extinct or endangered languages so comanche from the us cora from south africa cajun french from louisiana manx from the isle of man welsh romany a whole whole swathe of different languages and um, I had the opportunity to interview Susan not long before she died. And we were talking about the last silent movie. Um, and I was saying to her about how, what a strong sense of loss I felt was kind of embedded in that, in that work. Um, particularly because people were not just talking about language as a tool of communication, but as a articulation of a culture of a way of life somehow there was a sense that it was not just words that were being lost but something of a much greater scale and she said you know she said um i'm quoting what we call reality is totally provisional it's structured by language i believe that every language narrates its own world its own sense of time and space I wondered if you could respond to that notion of language narrating its own world, which, which echoes the title of the, of the project, Swirl of Words, Swirl of Worlds. Yeah, I, I, when, when you, um, 
there's, there's, I was just thinking uh, when, when you're speaking to Nebs about, the, you know, when you're talking about the loss of, of language, I suppose one way in which language is, is, is lost is when the language, you know, disappears and you have the last speakers of a, of a language kind of generally. But, it, but another way in which there's a sense of loss in language, and, and I really had this sense in, you know, in Zineb's, in Zineb's work, is, is the idea of, of language not being transmitted through generations. Uh, and, I, and I have that experience as well. So my, my children don't speak Spanish. You know, we didn't, they didn't learn to speak Spanish. I have children in, in, in we have children in, you know, in the UK, and they, they learned, they learned um, uh, English. And, and despite my best kind of <laughs> intentions, you know, it was hard enough to have kids, let alone have them in, in two languages. So, so, they, so they, they don't. And I never, ever imagined that that would be the case. I never imagined I would have children who didn't speak my language. And, and, and my family in Spain find it just incomprehensible. <laughs> <laughs> that they shouldn't, um, they shouldn't speak uh, Spanish, and, and 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 there is a kind of loss there, and I think it relates to what you're saying, Shalene, because I feel that there's, um, it's not simply the loss of of, it's not simply the the lost ability to be able to speak, but it's 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 I suppose it's the lost ability to be able to see the world in a particular way, you know, through that yeah. language, through that contingency, and and I, I I feel that as a as a deep loss, it's a deep kind of disappointment um, to me. At the same time, though. <laughs> I remember uh, talking to someone, I, I went to an international school at one point and, uh, where most people spoke a number of languages and there was an English teacher there, Melvin Elfie, and he said, um, you know, you're all really, um, um, you're all very unlucky because, you know, having to rely on a single language is really precious. And so I kind of, <laughs> there was something, which I think also relates to that kind of idea of, of, of how, how something is kind of framed in, in, in that reality, but um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely speaking a few languages allows you to perhaps enter or have insight into the country the language comes from. I do believe that, because I understand Arabic, I speak French and English, and of course I live in England, but I do understand better the tradition, the culture, um, what's going on in those places. And yes, I, I'm like you, uh, Juan, I just feel a sense of failure in terms of <laughs> it's not speaking Arabic for that matter. And, and the French is so basic that it's become embarrassing when they come to France with me. <laughs> and I hope as, as adults, they will uh, develop um, this skill by themselves. But I, I, I do feel this kind of sense of, of failure because I do, uh, and I, I do appreciate knowing all those languages and the fact that they don't and they rely on in English uh, on English because they believe it is the international language and after all that's gonna take them that's enough you know they don't need more than that and I just think like it's um yes there is a sadness about that I think you know um, that they won't be able to kind of uh, have you know experience you know this kind of multitude of of vision or reality or whatever you want to call it I mean Jillian you can talk about that also with Arabic you know and and you know, I don't know. Yes, indeed. I mean, my first language was actually Italian. I have a recorded, there's a recording somewhere of me speaking, speaking fluent Italian at the age of three, of which I have no, no recollection now. And then that was supplanted by Arabic and then by English. So I think my brain is, is extremely muddled. <laughs> <laughs> and then I studied ancient Greek and Latin. So that really uh, added to the confusion. <laughs> but I want to Paris. Get... <laughs> and then you studied in France, so you speak French also. And I studied in France. But let's go back to the question of, you know, things being lost and, and what the role of the artist is. Um, and a question for you, Zinev, which is really that more recently your work, in your work, you've been exploring archives and forgotten histories of different kinds. Um, looking, for example, at the so-called Black Decade of the Algerian Civil War in the 1990s or revolutionary and liberation movements and the relationship with film in the 1960s and, and 70s. So, I mean, just thinking again about um, Susan's film, you know, how much is it the role of the artist and in relation to language, in relation to questions of identity and history, is, is it to bring to the surface things that have been lost or discarded and ignored? I mean, yeah, in my case, I do believe that uh, I want to give a, a voice or noise to the silences, you know, those silences, those neglects, those, those part of history um, that has been, you know, forgotten, neglected, uh, voluntary or not, you know. Uh, so, yeah, really to give it a voice, to give it a visibility, that's what I'm, I've, I've been trying to do, I guess, you know, 
I guess, from the beginning, since 2002 with mother tongue, this idea of the loss um, uh, and the forgotten is, 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 uh, is a worry to me, you know, is a worry. And, and yet it's also very exciting to work I mean, when I discover things, you know, in the archive, things that not many people have been able, it's, here I'm talking about the Algerian archive because not many people had access to them. So I feel really, really lucky to be able to see things that perhaps one, you know, would find it very difficult to access to and then to be able to share it then with an audience and with a wider, you know, privilege for me, it's like wonderful because the idea was always to, to share and communicate my findings or, you know, or the archival material. Um, so, um, so yeah, as simply as that, is, yeah, to kind of uh, give it a voice really to the sciences. Uh, Can I remind people to put questions in the chat, um, in the Q&A, sorry, so we can come to questions shortly. Um, and one, turning to you, I, you were born in Spain, grew up in Wales, and there the, the, the struggle not to lose language, not to be silent, literally not to be silenced or stopped from speaking a language, um, Catalan, Welsh, you know, is, makes language the site of political struggle. And I wonder if you could say something about how that, if it has, that experience of language informed your practice. Yes, um, and, and it's very nice in, in, in just on, on that kind of Spanish, Welsh thing, it's very nice in, 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 in the exhibition. I was really pleased that Ingrid uh, placed my work next to that amazing photo of um, Mario Mertz visiting the Eisteddfod in, 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 in Wales and, you know, the, 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 you know, and that, that work about the Welsh language being kind of um, um, curbed. Um, so and it was really nice to see that. Yeah, it, it, I mean, <laughs> funnily, I mean, I, I, you know, I come from I come from the from the right bang in the middle of Spain. So I come from kind of Spanish speaking Castilian, you know, Spain. Um, uh, and uh, and I suppose that the the uh, and, and Wales, of course, is on the you know ha has a different kind of relationship to the to the centre, um, and which, which was which is interesting. Um, I mean, I, I, I think um, I think one one of the, one of the things about um, about displacement when you when you're quite young is is that is that you um, you know I, I had I had a very uh, odd picture of what Wales would be like when we came here when we were when we were when we were children um, because I I was told I was coming to an island so my my sense of an island was that it was warm and it had palm trees and you know oasis and but I was looking forward to that and of course you know Wales Cardiff in in, in 1977 was something quite different uh, uh, to that to that really and and, and then going into a, a school. You know, let alone English food, that was that was a pretty much of a shock. And but then English, and then and then Welsh being spoken was was was, was slightly was slightly bizarre. And I, th I think you, you sort of become a you know, I never you know I, d I think when you're a child and you, you live somewhere, you never really think of yourself as having a nationality. You just you just are. And then you move somewhere else, and then you suddenly realise, oh yes, I am Spanish, and I've got this this very kind of um, you know strange name that people can't really uh, pronounce. So, so yeah, th th those those things are all kind of quite um, quite tricky. I've never, I mean, I've got to say, I've never really, um, uh, I've never really dealt with, with an idea of uh, a sort of Welshness. Uh, it, it's always felt kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of being kind of somewhere in here from, from Spain g gave me a, a certain kind of relationship to language that I could, that I could use and that was important. Um, but I, I must admit, as 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 I was saying before, in, in what I was saying in the answer to the previous question, I've been quite interested or concerned recently with the idea of what is uh, what is a, a kind of authentic uh, voice. You know how you can how you can speak to, to something that is authentic in terms of your your kind of experience and even your intonation, um, and that 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 kind of sense of of of, of being in, in, in Wales is, is, uh, is, is important in relation, in relation to that, um, increasingly important actually, because I think it's sort of, you know, it, it, I think that the, the, the Spanish part of me, the language and, and the identity or whatever was, was, has always been the slightly more kind of exoticized bit in my own mind. Um, but the reality of the experience is probably Welsh and it, I mean, it, it, it's really, 
you know, even living now in, in, in kind of Scotland most of the time as I, as I do, that, that kind of sense, that I, it, it's always appealed to me to be on the kind of, um, you know, on, 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 on the edges, certainly in this country, of, 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 that, of, that, of that culture. Um, but I can't really, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, 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 that, in, that, in that question of the, of the Welsh, but I, I don't know if I have anything kind of more to say about that. You can't, we, when we were talking before and you said you were asking about Spain and Wales, I did think, oh God, that's something I really need to kind of process a bit better than I think I have, actually. Um, yeah. And one thing perhaps we could, we could uh, touch on as well as maybe something about mistranslation um, and the sort of uh, comedy uh, as well as the tragedy sometimes of miscommunication and mistranslation. And that's something that comes through very much in John Smith's piece, um, Steve Hates Chips, where he holds up an app to all these signs in the street and it it translates into these bizarre assemblages of words. Um, and it kind of speaks to the frustration of, of not being able to communicate, um, which is funny on one level, but on another level um, can be, can, can almost be deadly, you know, if you don't have the language to articulate yourself or make yourself heard or communicate need, um, you know, that can be crippling. And as I say, at some, in some tragic cases, deadly. Um, so I, I wondered if you could reflect a bit on, on that question of miscommunication. Yeah. When I, um, <laughs> Uh, Emily, who's here on the call, when we, 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 we got married, we were married in uh, Aberystwyth uh, uh, Town Hall in, in, uh, in Wales. And, and when we went to, the, to, to tell the registrar my name, they spelled Juan C H W A N and Cruz, uh, uh, was it G R W something or other, T H again. So and it was kind of. It was, of course, just how, just the, you know, the way the way it kind of sounded. But but it, and it reminded me of a little bit of, of I mean, of, of of that of what you described about John Smith's work. Of, you know, the the, the 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 way in which kind of things. I, I love that work. So I, I I just love the kind of simplicity of the kind of mechanism or the app that he's using to 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 you know insistently kind of shift these shift these um, shift these meanings. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm, do, I'm doing just. <laughs> so, uh, on, yeah, I, I guess that's more on the kind of comedic side of that. I, but, but yeah. Um. Zena, well, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm thinking of the role of uh, of body language and other form of communication relating really, to situation and, and for example, um, mother tongue piece. Uh, my daughter and my mother. A lot of people were very saddened by the fact that they could not communicate but and and that kind of took me back after doing the piece because i thought of course they can communicate that so many other ways they don't need to speak uh, you know using arabic or, or french or english and hence why i did the second piece later on uh, which is a photographic triptych where it's more concentrating on the body language rather than uh, uh, rather than the the, the, the voice and, and so um yeah yeah, um, that, that would be my contribution. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I really want uh, some questions from our lovely participants. I know there's some wonderful people here with us this evening. So please, please, please put a question into the Q&A. Don't be shy. Um, and I wonder then if we could talk a little bit about writing, because you both write. Um, and <laughs> in your research, you know, if you do, you do write. And I know, Juan, you've, you've published a collection of art writing. Um, so perhaps you could say a little bit about how writing as a practice um, intercuts and interweaves with the visual, because we haven't really talked about the relation between the written word or the spoken word and visual forms of communication and what what, how those two interact? 
Yeah. I mean, I can. I mean, for, for, for me, for me, the, the 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 written word and the spoken word, I, I would say first, are really utterly kind of, for me, utterly different things. Um, uh, and I've tried, you know, I mean, I, so I've I've tried making, I've I've done works where translations are the oral translations and they're spoken, and and and, and I think we in, in those works, what 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 feels. Um, um, quite important is 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 the, the haltingness of of the language. So the fact that things kind of stop, and and certainly with with translating Don Quixote, what I was interested in was was, was the way in which somehow you you know what one was visibly processing language, and uh, and and you know thinking about what happened to that language as it came in through your eyes from the from the text, and went through your your brain and turned into something else and came out and was you know. Questions about was was that what I was saying or thinking or what someone else was was thinking and, and saying and to what extent could I own it and interpret it and or not, um, and of course the liveness of that is important as well because there's no space or there's no room to to check or to you know to make sure what something is right or wrong. When I've done I've, I have done um, written translations as well where I've, I've translated books novels from Spanish to um, um, to English and I also translated a um, um, my, my, my father, um, grandfather's memoirs, and, and so I've done a lot of written translations. That I've just and, and which, which and, and I've published those books as, as kind of books, but they've also been sort of quasi books, quasi artworks. But of course, any any publishing process means that the text goes through an editing process, gets revised, and, and that changes things massively. I did another, I translated another Spanish novel, Bivaroja, on a on a typewriter. The idea being that I wouldn't go back and correct or or edit it, and of course that that then became something completely different. So those, I suppose I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say that those those um, those different kinds of uh, well, to me those different sorts of you know textures of, of language are a, a, sort, a sort of a sort of important um, as and I don't know if it's about a kind of materiality. I think it's about different you know language having different kinds of qualities and and and. And not being entirely, uh, uh, not being at all. Well, being so somewhat instrumental, but not being necessarily instrumental. Having a different sort of, you know, set of, you know, relationships and, um, a, you know, different kind of set of possibilities. I suppose. I mean, prints as well of words, where where the language became, language is something quite quite different um, as well. Um, uh, yeah. It's always struck me that Britain is a very literary culture, which seems to have more confidence in words than it does in images. And, and so there's a, there's a sense that images on their own can't sort of hold a space, hold a discourse, but have to be supplemented, propped up with language in a different way. Zinab, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I don't know. I'm... I must say I'm, I'm much more at ease with writing with English rather than French. Uh, probably it's out of laziness because I believe that English is a bit easier than French because of all the complex conjugation around the French language. But um, talking about translating, really, I, I really, really love doing subtitles for my videos. Because I, do so <laughs> many, I do so many interviews in Arabic or in French, who always has to be, at one point has to be translated in English. And I really enjoy that moment when I'm facing the person on video and having to translate not only the word, but the mood, the mood and, and um, yeah. And in the case of Algerian, because it's a dialect, it's even more kind of interesting because you have a, an injection of Berber words with French words, all conjugated in Arabic. It's kind of a mishmash of things and it's hilarious. And I really, so uh, the only translation I do really is subtitles for my videos, but it's always, a, I must say a moment, which is, I really enjoy. It's very tedious, it takes ages forever to be done. But once it's done, it's very enjoyable, I must say, you know. Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not like Juan. I don't, make, I don't write books, and the only writing I'm doing is through statement for work or a few emails every now and then. And uh, uh, but yeah, I'm not at ease really in seeing. I'm much more at ease with visual images and and all that I am with language in general, writing for that matter. This is really, um, you know, I, I, you know, I don't really, you know, like doing, you know, talking about my work. Really, I like to make it. That's what I like. Doing. <laughs> well, we have some questions. So 
I'm going to um, ask you some of the audience questions. So the first question is from Janice McLaren, who says, do either of you have a favorite or treasured word in any language? Wow. While you're thinking about that, <laughs> I, I'll take, I'll, I'll maybe just say something to give Zinev and Juan a chance to, to think. Yeah. There's a wonderful word in Arabic, uh, which is uh, rohi, which, which is used to, to say my beloved, but it also means my soul and kind of my breath. It's mm -hmm. an extraordinary word that has no real translation because it covers mm -hmm. all of those all of those bases in one word. Mm. It's an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary word. One, what's yours? I've always, well, the, 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 the reminds me of the, the rodavaja is a, is, a, is, a, is a type of fish in Spain. I've always liked that word. <laughs> That's a different, <laughs> um, uh, but um, um, I've always liked, there, there's a word, I, I, there's, there's some words that I, that I've, uh, I, I like that I always try and, um, uh, kind of wedge from one language into the other. So nitido is 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 a Spanish word which means uh, really clear and clear. And I try and say knitted sometimes, N I T I D in English, because <laughs> I think I'll translate it by just taking the O off and giving it a different intonation. But it, it never really works. No one really ever knows that word. But nitido is is, is I've always liked that that word because it, it has a sort of it means it means clear and crystalline and. Um, but it's somehow because it's it's because the the, let, the, the letters in it are very vertical. It, it sort of seems to to kind of embody that as well. I, I often quite like words that because of the way they look as well. That there's something about uh, you know like peer is a nice is a really nice looking word. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I know there's something about the look of it. So so the the, the visual of, of a word is often quite important for me in my kind of liking of it. Zina, what's Maybe we'll come back to you then. We'll come back. So the next question is from Andrew Wilson. And Andrew says, I'm fascinated about how poetry can be direct in communication, but also slip between meaning and register, meaning being found words and phrases rather than maybe within the words themselves. And I wonder if Juan or Zineb could think about how this affects translation but also more generally an approach to artistic practice. Yeah, I, I, that's a, I can say so. I, I, I immediately thought about just just back to the kind of work in the in the. Um, so my work in the exhibition, the translating Don Quixote. Um, uh, and just remembering uh, sometimes being being just getting to, to a line and starting to translate it by saying, you know, the man, then, and, you know, you get so far in terms of translating word by word, but then, then of course, you realise that to translate the line, you're going to need to shift the words around into a different order. Yeah. And so you need to start trying to do that. And then you may be, it becomes very easy to forget what was the first word that you started, you started speaking. And then I remember, really clear, remember, clearly remember when I, was, when I was in the process of doing that, a feeling at a certain point of, of, of just kind of a levitation <laughs> or kind of floating because you're involved in translating something and you just lose you know, lo losing a sense of where you are in the kind of organization of these of these terms in relation to each other uh, and there being a certain kind of elation in the possibility that these things become kind of meaningless or free floating at a certain point uh, but actually, really troubling because you just you, you know you lose a sense of a sense of a sense of meaning, and and and, and that that reminds me a little bit of of, of what what Andrew's kind of trying to, to you know to suggest about you know translations of things where people don't really understand the language and productive misunderstandings, and you know what happens when you know the sounds suddenly become significant not because of what they mean but because of what they're kind of where they're hovering. So I certainly no. recognise that. Zina? Well, I'm mean, going back again to the subtitles. It's, it's always um, um, a decision that I have to take um, about whether I translate uh, the sentence as it is, as it's said, as it's delivered, you know, or whether I have to rework it to make it fit within a certain space because the problem with the subtitles, you have to 
you know, keep it to a certain length. Otherwise you end up having many lines and it takes longer to, so, uh, and then you have, then you have to get into the process of editing. What do you keep? What do you take off? What do you change? Which word do you use to make it shorter? And then you start affecting part of the meaning of the sentence. So there is all this question. But as I said, I find it fascinating because it's kind of, I'm debating with myself around the sentences or a word and, uh, and having also to look through the dictionary to find perhaps another word that can be as appropriate but shorter. In. So the, the length and the, through the look also of the word um, is also very important. <clears throat> but um, I'm guessing that <clears throat> that's when my um, uh, vocal vocabulary is extending. It's when I'm kind of doing a subtitle because I'm looking a lot at the dictionary and adding of stories and adding, you know, discovering new words, you know. So, um... Andrew's added a note. Also, there are great translations of poetry written by poets who didn't understand the language they were translating. A productive misunderstanding, perhaps. Um, then the next question is thinking about the swirl of words project and how poetry varies across languages. Do either of you read literature or poetry in your mother tongue? And if so, do you find it inspires you in a different way to when reading English? I always try to read literature or poetry from the language that it has been written in. I won't, you know, if it's been written in, in English, I'm gonna read, read it in English. If it's in French, I'm gonna, so I always go to the original as possible to the original language if I can, you know, read that language. Um, yes, I do, I do feel it does affect. It does, it does when I read a, a French book, I get into a different mood that when I get into an English, because I'm also French and I know some of the, I don't know, the, 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 the ways, the French ways perhaps, I don't know. It kind of put me in a different kind of space and um, which is a space I share, but to be honest, I, I tend to read more English in any case uh, because I live in England. So um, uh, yeah, I don't know if I answered the question, but that's my contribution. <laughs> Lovely. Um, and then the final question, I think, from Ingrid Svensson is, I was wondering about the relationship between describing and showing, the fragility between, in, between words and images. And this is where Fabian Peake and Stephen Watts's work is to me so compelling because they explore these intersections. So it's about the relationship between describing and showing the fragility between words and images. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I did a, um, I, I made a, a work in, uh, for Camden Arts Centre years ago, in, I think in 2000, or 99 or 2000, um, which was a description of a, of a drive back actually from, from, from Wales, it was called Driving Back. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, and the way I made that work was to make a, I made a series of kind of photographs of all the stages of the, the, the first stages of the journey, of the road, and then, and then wrote um, descriptions. And, and I tried to, I, I used a sort of architectural vocabulary, so I tried to make the, the, the descriptions as, as what I thought of as objective and cold as possible. So, you know, there's a bush to the right, there's a telegraph pole standing, but, but of course you, you realise very quickly, I think, with language, that it's sort of impossible to describe anything objectively through language. And, and, and you know, that what you are really doing is, is, is kind of showing stuff. You know, it's, uh, well, I, find, I think it's impossible, however cold you try to make it. But, um, and when I first showed the work, it was just a recording of me reading those, those descriptions. So it was very kind of, you know, there was nothing to look at. It was just, um, just, just, just the same. But recently, I, re I remade that work recently, I mean, and I've been doing quite a lot of. I've, I've been remaking quite a lot of work recently. And funnily enough, you know, the work in in this show, as well of words, was was a sort of remake of, of a work from before. But I've been quite interested in remaking works, and particularly because the work is is based in language. Language has a certain malleability. You know, that it can be in a book, it can be it can be spoken, it, it can do different things in different in different contexts. But you 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 can sort of carry quite a lot lot a lot with you in language um, that you can't necessarily in objects. Um, and when I remade this work, I I, I reincorporated the the photographs, the images from which the descriptions have been taken, which. In the first instance, I chose not to do because I thought it was just absurd. Why would you want to see the photograph when you have the description? 
Um, but of course, when you when you put them together, they did something quite they did something quite different. Uh, and and I'm, I'm reminded, Zineb, I think, in that of your when you when you talk about subtitles and, and your fascination with subtitles, because I, th I think there is something about you know bringing two things that ostensibly mean the same things together, but which operate in a different register, that does open something up that is kind of that is fascinating um, and, and 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 quite engaging. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, um, on the contrary to you, Juan, I, I, for me anyway, because I'm perhaps not so at ease with written or spoken words, is that the image really tells it all for me. And hence why I find it quite difficult when you ask to provide some explanation, a statement, some text. When I'm asked to write, you know, a work, I'm finding it quite difficult, but because I believe there is so much happening in the work or in the image, <laughs> in some ways there is an openness that perhaps word doesn't allow, or if I was to write it anyway, it wouldn't allow this kind of openness, this kind of um, uh, uh, universal reading, perhaps that the image will can allow it. Hence, why I tend to prefer that people, other people, write about my work and put their own interpretation to the world rather than having me to put it in writing can speak about it but even then i'm always feeling when i finish the conversation that i've missed out i've forgotten some some aspect of the work which were important you know so i'm i'm you know I, I, for me the image should tell, tell it and that should be enough and sometimes even the title i believe is not really necessary but um Anyway, it's just me. I know it's my my uh, kind of frustration with not being able to, you know. But but, but that's it. But because for me that 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 the I, 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 the distinction you're making between um, image and, and writing, I I, um, I understand. I I think I understand the distinction you're making. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I would understand it as a distinction between registers rather than necessarily forms, because because I, I think I think because I find myself. You know, sometimes I guess, I guess the equivalent would be if you're when you're asked to write about a work that you've made that is in writing, and, mm. and it, maybe it's as difficult as writing about an image because if, if the intention of the work is not, you know, didactic necessarily, yeah. it, 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 it maybe that, that, that. But that, but I do appreciate that the, the you know the idea that, and I think it relates back to maybe to Ingrid's question. You know, that, that, that maybe it's 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 a difference between something that is descriptive and something that is demonstrative. Um, mm. Is, is is maybe is maybe key because I, I really want to hold out this idea that writing doesn't need to be um, you know considered um, authoritative I suppose in that way yeah yeah I, I mean I like to think that they both can stand on their own and they can also meet you know at time depending on on, on the artist's choice really you know well, I think that's a beautiful place to end there's so much to be said I think we could be talking about this for many more hours and we have hardly touched on amazing works in the show um, but it's been an absolute joy to be in conversation with you Zeynab and Juan over to Ingrid likewise thank you Jelaine okay, thank you Thanks, thank you Jelaine and Juan um, it's been a really I think uh, often with these sorts of conversations you sort of feel that you're beginning to get going and the juices start to flow and I think there's so much um, complexity in the various different um, artworks in the exhibition but also once you look at the, it's the, the book of poems which I hope everybody will get a copy yeah. of um, there's just a huge amount to be mined and thought about and the, and and the simplicity and complexities is sort of to me quite baffling and quite exciting so um and i've really really enjoyed your contributions this evening um those as i've said as i said earlier there will be a number of other talks throughout um the the exhibition period until the middle of august and one of those well two of those will be looking at ideas around suppression of language um minoritized languages endangered languages um, and that will, and Gabriel Coxhead, who is Susan Hiller's son, will be talking about her work. Um, and so do look on the website for dates and information, because we're putting those on over the next few days with some information there, but we'll be adding to that 
in the coming days. Um, but it's been really, really lovely uh, to, to, to hear your thoughts and I've really enjoyed this evening and thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you, thank you for inviting us. Thank you, thanks Ingrid.